Welcome, everyone, uh, to the CFPU um, seminar series. Um, it's my pleasure tonight, uh, today, to uh, welcome Brendan Krill from JPL and Caltech. Um, many of us work on all sky imaging surveys, uh, but Brendan's going to tell us about an exciting all sky spectroscopic survey, um, and particularly the, the next big, the next, well, next after JWST launch. Uh, for NASA, uh, and that is SphereX. So Brendan, take it away. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to get to speak to you guys and tell you about this exciting mission that I'm working on. It was, it was pretty new. It was approved only about a year and a half ago. Um, so we're really excited to move ahead with it. And um, so I'll tell you all about the mission, but um, I wanted to start by just mentioning that um, I'm not, I'm not sure if you guys knew this, but I'm, uh, I was an undergrad at Brown. I graduated in 1995. And um, so um, it's very exciting to be addressing all you guys who are probably scattered in various locations around the Providence area. Um, and, uh, you know, basically my journey that led me to this point um, started uh, in that area. And in fact, um, there are a couple of, uh, I guess, motivating um, factors for the SphereX mission that I first learned about and was inspired by um, uh, back there, uh, sitting in class in Barris and Holly in the early 90s. Uh, one of those things was the very plot I'm projecting here. Many of you are probably familiar with this. This is from the early 80s and shows, um, illustrates the expansion history of the universe in the context of the idea of inflation that, you know, very early in the universe, you had uh, quantum scales blown up to cosmological scales really in the blink of an eye. And, you know, uh, sitting there, I guess it would have been in 1992, um, taking introductory astrophysics and cosmology from uh, Robert Brandenburger um, back in the day. Uh, I first saw this plot and, you know, definitely captured my imagination. And, you know, of course, the main thing, questions you guys all grapple with theoretically and um, observationally is um, what physics could have caused this expansion. But as, as we know, this framework um, helps explain a lot of the kind of conundrums that, that we see in uh, cosmology observations, but uh, the physics itself is still pretty mysterious. And um, so even today, the, the answer to this is still fairly um, unknown, but uh, we've made a lot of progress in modeling uh, what caused inflation, um, the consequences of inf inflation phenomenologic phenomenologically. And so we've been able to kind of narrow in on at least uh, some of uh, the physics that had to underlie uh, this effect. And I think another area that kind of blew my mind back in the early 90s is the fact that, you know, uh, the, the plotted in this, uh, in this way, um, the history of the universe is only pretty ob observable for a very small sliver of this. And we have to go pretty far back from the universe, at least in exponential time. Uh, we have to go pretty far back from the universe we can see with photons to try to infer what was happening during the inflationary period. Um, so another thing that happened in the early 90s that captured my imagination was uh, the results from the Kobe experiment. So I think at that point, the idea of the hot big bang was pretty solid already. Um, but this beautiful measurement from the FIRAS instrument on Kobe really nailed that. It proved beyond a reason, by, by beyond any doubt that uh, the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background fit a black body extremely well. Um, so on the left, you see the first results from the Mather et al. paper um, uh, that came out and, you know, we were all excitedly talking about back in the early 90s. And then later, um, you know, those results just got better and better as Kobe went on, the data were refined. Um, and I, I just love this image from the Fixin et al. paper in 96, which kind of summarized the final results from FireRAS, and especially this note in the caption that says, the uncertainties are a small fraction of the line thickness, which is uh, um, pretty, uh, pretty impressive, of course. And so um, this, I think, really ushered in what, you know, we've called precision cosmology. There have been a lot of um, 
uh, measurements since then, but I, but I think this, this kind of showed that it was possible to make extremely precise measurements and constrain uh, um, what was going on in the early universe uh, very uh, tightly. And uh, so that, that was also very inspiring to me. And so then um, back to the idea of inflation, of course, the, one of the other instruments on COBE, uh, the differential microwave radiometer, um, was also making measurements of the temperature of the cosmic background radiation across the sky. Um, you know, the, the, the top plot, the, to the top panel here, of course, you have the, the monopole, it's incredibly uniform. The, it uh, showed the idea of isotropy of the universe was, was very good um, to the, you know, 10 to the minus fifth level. Uh, but then as you start subtracting off the components, the mean and then the dipole due to the solar system's movement relative to the CMB, um, the structures uh, that were present, that were imprinted on the cosmic background radiation 13 billion years ago became um, uh, uh, visible uh, for the first time. And th this was also very profound because this shows that there were um, structures imprinted in the background radiation that were larger than the classical horizon. Um, so uh, so that, that was also quite fascinating. And this is what led me to, um, I, so I worked in uh, the lab as an undergrad with uh, Peter Timby, and I actually built a, um, uh, a CMB polarimeter that I ran on the roof of Barrison Holly uh, for my senior thesis uh, for a few days. Um, you know, it was pretty pathetically um, uh, unsensitive, but I, but I think eventually it turned into some experiments that uh, Brian Keating and others worked on. Um, so uh, so that, that was pretty cool, and it, it led me to go to grad school, and I, I worked on measuring the cosmic microwave background for most of my career up to this point. And, um, you know, since then, as I'm sure you all know, uh, we've learned quite a bit about the early universe uh, through a series of space missions, also suborbital measurements from the ground, from balloons, um, and so on. Um, but really, there's the series of space missions, uh, COBE and WMAP, um, led by NASA, um, and then uh, the Planck mission, which um, I spent about the last 15 years working on, um, have really extracted um, an immense amount of information. And, and actually, we're at this really amazing point for uh, precision cosmology, where um, what you see in these uh, fairly complicated um, maps of structure at the surface of last scattering imprinted on the cosmic microwave background, a, a model with very few parameters. In fact, a six CDM model data very well. Um, you can um, uh, parameters in there, but uh, they don't improve the constraining power. Um, so, th so this is uh, is very solid at this point. Um, so two of these parameters that are known very precisely um, are related to the early universe, to inflation itself. They involve the spectrum um, and the amplitude of the initial fluctuations that, that uh, cosmic, uh, that, that um, led to, to all the structure we see in the universe eventually. Um, so uh, the cosmic microwave background through measurements of the temperature, polarization fluctuations, the cross correlation between those two, and then more recently, um, actually looking at the weak lensing of that um, anisotropic signal and the statistics of that um, has led to this, this very strong constraining power. And so um, I think there's been a lot of progress on um, studying this idea of inflation at this point. Um, so, uh, you know, these are kind of qualitatively what we know about at this point. Um, you know, we found coherent structures that have been uh, that, that are larger than the classical horizon. The universe is geometrically flat. There's, um, you know, cur curvature is, is quite small, if, if at all. Um, the primordial fluctuations that had to be created by inflation and, and seed what we see in the cosmic background radiation are close to scale invariant, but not quite, which is important because it uh, uh, lends some support to this idea of the slow rolling process within inflation. Um, we've also found that uh, scalar fluctuations dominate over um, fluctuations in uh, space-time itself. Um, and that's, that's known uh, by a number of things, including 
uh, strong limits on B-mode polarization in the cosmic background radiation. Um, another uh, very interesting area is the, the fact that the fluctuations we see in the cosmic background radiation, and, and actually pretty much anywhere, um, are Gaussian distributed. Um, I'll get to more on that in a moment, but I think the main point is inflation holds together so far, but um, we still need to kind of zero in on it more to get a uh, tighter phenomenological understanding of what had to happen um, to, to cause inflation. Um, so let me go to this, this idea of Gaussian distribution. So if you look at the map of the cosmic background radiation, you see a pattern of hot and cold spots. Um, and if you literally just make a histogram of those temperature values, um, you'll find that to very good approximation, um, it follows a, a Gaussian distribution. Um, and so that's kind of a direct consequence of the fact that, uh, well, it implies that the initial fluctuations that led to all this structure, the, the initial fluctuations that were uh, presumably um, at a quantum scale and then blown up to cosmological scale by inflation were also Gaussian distributed. So that tells you something about the, uh, the, the field or fields that, that caused inflation and what kind of um, ground state they had, what the potential looked like, and so on. So um, how, how uh, Gaussian are, are these fluctuations? Um, so uh, again, we, we can look at this phenomenologically. And one way that um, uh, people have studied non-Gaussianity is through this parameter you call FNL. So if instead of fitting a Gaussian, you also fit um, this additional higher order term. Um, you can then constrain that um, and measurements of the full sky um, of the cosmic micro background fluctuations have uh, kind of narrowed in on this quite a bit. So the, the W map maps of the sky uh, put pretty tight constraints on this already and then Planck took that down uh, even further. Um, and so at this point, uh, this parameter in the units that are typically uh, used uh, is known to be uh, less than around 10 at the two sigma level. Um, and one interesting point about this limit is that uh, we're very close to what's called the cosmic variance limit in, in studying uh, Gaussianity through the cosmic background radiation. Now, what that means is that um, we're, we're essentially sampling a random field. And so um, at some point, uh, the, the set of measurements you have uh, just simply runs out of constraining power. And, uh, you know, it's possible at, to, to um, get slightly tighter constraints by more precise measurements of smaller scale polarization in the cosmic background radiation. But um, we think we're only going to do marginally better, that um, the cosmic variance one sigma limit is on order of three to four. So, so we're very close to that. Um, but um, this, so th this then, um, you know, I know other folks have studied large scale structure. Um, there, there's tons of beautiful measurements out there, but this, this has led my career in the direction of starting to contemplate um, other ways of constraining Gaussianity. Um, so this image, of course, is the Hubble, Hubble Ultra Deep Field, um, which um, is, is a thing of great beauty. Um, but I think it, it uh, illustrates the fact that uh, there are just so many galaxies out there. And um, the, the fact that there's so many of them, you can, you can measure out to, to very distant, um, uh, to very great distances. Um, and actually measure structure, um, the, the 3D uh, structure of the universe through studying galaxies, um, gives you much more um, constraining power on things like Gaussianity, be, simply because you have more, um, more modes to sample. So um, how does this work? So shown here is um, a couple of simulations. This is kind of a 2D projection of 3D distribution of dark matter density with uh, galaxies shown in blue on top of that. Um, in the case with no Gaussianity, um, uh, you get the structure you see on the right. And then in an extreme Gauss, uh, non-Gaussianity case where this FNL parameter is blown up to a thousand, that's way overblown, but it, it lets you see by eye the difference you get in the structure. Um, uh, you can see that the distribution looks different. And so, um, what you could do uh, 
in large scale structure measurements is uh, look at the correlation between galaxies. And so you can do that in a couple of ways. You can do what's called the two point function. You just kind of measure the distance between each galaxy and every other galaxy. Um, and uh, that's called the two point function. And it's uh, equivalent uh, in some sense to the, to the power spectrum of the distribution of those galaxies. And then you can also do higher order statistics as well. So you can draw triangles um, and compute uh, something called the bispectrum as well. Uh, so of course this has been done, as I said, there's, there's a very rich field. Many of you are probably involved in this. Um, this summarizes um, as of last year, um, uh, measurements of the power spectrum of, of galaxy distribution. Um, and uh, so what you, the, the, the different colored uh, measurements you see on here come from a number of sources. So on the uh, right-hand side of this plot, you see results from the ground. There's been uh, galaxy surveys such as DES, SDSS, and BOSS um, that have studied not only the, the distribution of galaxies on the sky, but have looked at, at many other statistics as well. Um, things like Lyme and alpha features uh, and um, uh, cosmic shear to try to constrain the, the distribution of matter. And this has done a fantastic job at probing things like the expansion history of the universe, uh, dark matter and dark energy and so on. Um, the other data points you see that are at larger scale, um, uh, you, you see the constraints actually come from Planck measurements. So you can use the angular power spectrum measured of the of the CMB and of CMB lensing to infer what uh, the distribution of matter uh, at late times has to be. And um, these are such large scales that uh, these are more easily accessible, I would say, from space where you can measure the, the full sky. And if you really want to start poking at effects that come from inflation itself, um, you want a, a clean look at um, super horizon physics. Um, and so this kind of motivates the idea of going back into space for, for some large scale structure surveys um, to get this very large volume. So that finally brings us to this uh, SphereX mission. Um, so uh, shown here is a list of the, the science team. Um, our principal investigator is Jamie Bach, who's a professor at Caltech. Um, the project scientist is Olivier Doré at JPL. Um, you can see that the, the science team is kind of heavily weighted towards the Pasadena area. Um, my role in this experiment is what's called the data pipeline architect. So it's my job to um, figure out how we're going to analyze the data and set up all that software infrastructure. That execution is actually going to happen at IPAC, the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center, which is located on Caltech's campus and exists to support NASA's infrared space missions. And they have a lot of expertise in this kind of thing. Um, and that, that effort will be led by Rachel Akison. And then all the other folks on here, um, I'm sure uh, you have, uh, quite a number of them around the, the country and the world, where the Korea Science Institute um, um, as I mentioned, so yeah, JPL provides, is, is the main NASA center uh, managing this mission and uh, the, the main industrial partner who's building the spacecraft and uh, handling things like the, the downlink and so on are, is Ball Aerospace based in Boulder, Colorado. Um, so uh, SphereX is actually um, a mission in NASA's uh, Explorer program. So uh, the, the, many of you may be familiar with this program, uh, but basically it's, a, it's actually a competitively selected um, uh, process. There's an announcement of opportunity that comes out every few years. They alternate between what's called a medium explorer and a small explorer. So, you know, uh, by NASA standards, small means cost capped at like 145 million at this point and medium means 250 million. That doesn't include the um, the rocket itself. So um, obviously that's a lot of money, but um, you know, something like uh, the Roman Space Telescope, which is, is cost capped at 3 billion and you know, James Webb, 
is, is in the multi-billion, I think at this point around the six billion level. Um, so this, this is uh, relatively small for, for a uh, NASA uh, astrophysics mission. And um, th this program, I think, has been very successful. Um, the, the community really likes it because it kind of allows, uh, you know, really compelling science to be investigated kind of on a shorter turnaround than you would have with these uh, large multi-decade uh, flagship missions. And, um, you know, it kind of this competitive process kind of allows NASA to respond to what the community thinks are the most exciting uh, science questions at the moment. So you can see that a number of uh, uh, pretty famous missions are, are on here. WMAP, I think, being among them. Uh, this was, uh, was in a medium explorer program uh, selected in the late 90s. So in the case of SphereX, uh, we went through this competitive process. We submitted a proposal. Um, the first time we didn't make it, uh, we went through again. Uh, but finally, we were selected in February 2019. And so now we're kind of off and running and um, developing the mission. I can tell you a little more about that later on. Um, but I just wanted to show how this fits into the greater NASA scheme. So this is what SphereX is going to look like. Um, so it's, it's essentially a 20 centimeter wide field telescope. Um, it has a passive cooling system. It's designed to be to operate in low Earth orbit. That's what the acronym LEO stands for. Uh, the whole spacecraft, including the telescope and then what we call these photon shields, which um, I'll talk about more in a minute, um, is only about two meters high. Um, so it's, you know, fairly small. I'm about 1.8 meters tall. Um, so, uh, and, and in fact, th this is what it'll look like when it's all folded up and ready for launch. It's, it's small enough that, um, you know, we have a lot of room to spare in the, uh, the launch vehicle that we're being offered. Um, so like I mentioned, this is based around a wide field telescope. The, the idea is we're going to be studying lots of galaxies. We want to be able to image a wide field of sky at once. So we have a three meter off axis telescope that makes a nice clean point spread function. No, uh, diffraction spikes to deal with. Uh, the aperture is about 20 centimeters. So the field of view is quite big, 11 degrees wide in one dimension. And uh, we're tiling that field of view with uh, a mosaic of um, Hawaii 2RG infrared detectors, um, which will have a plate scale such that the, the pixels are, are 6.2 arc seconds. Um, so if you compare this with um, other missions which have been more focused on imaging, such as WISE is a good analogy. That was another Explorer mission. Um, WISE had a telescope that was, the primary mirror was slightly larger, 40 centimeters. So there was four times more collecting area. But in terms of field of view, we've arranged the, the rest of our optics are um, to produce this very wide field of view. So we have 65 more times more field of view than WISE did. So in terms of the throughput or aton do or whatever you call it, the A omega product, uh, SphereX is going to have 16 times more. And so this is really important in terms of mapping um, the sky, carrying out surveys, um, you know, getting as many photons as possible as you map out the sky. So how is SphereX going to do that? Um, so SphereX is going to operate in low Earth orbit, as I mentioned. Um, it's going to be, uh, you know, looking in a direction that it's, uh, is perpendicular to both the Earth and uh, the Sun, more or less. And it's going to follow uh, a polar orbit um, in what's called the terminator orbit, uh, meaning it's kind of always in a twilight um, situation. So it's going from pole to pole and uh, kind of precessing to follow the day-night edge. Um, so, so that way, that, that helps with thermal stability when you're in a low Earth orbit. It keeps the sun in kind of a, you know, similar-ish position um, in every part of the orbit and, and through most of the year. Um, so I think one pretty cool thing about our, our setup is a passive cooling system. We, you know, we're, we're trying to make measurements in the near-infrared, and so it helps to have a cold instrument and cold detectors so you don't have to deal with the glow from your telescope and, and the rest of your instrument. So we're following a design that imitates some of the features that uh, Planck used in an L2 orbit. So um, Planck had these 
uh, uh, structure is called V-grooves, which is, are these kind of mirrored um, uh, cone-shaped structures uh, that, uh, well, cone isn't really the right word, maybe like uh, uh, the, these kind of V-shaped collars that uh, go around the, the spacecraft and, and essentially couple radiators to deep space only so that you can, you can point those radiators so that they never see the Earth or the sun. And so with SphereX, so this managed to keep Planck to, at a temperature of 36 Kelvin. Of course, Planck was at L2, which is a lot more um, uh, thermally favorable than being in low Earth orbit because you're very far from the, the Earth. Um, but with SphereX, we've uh, set up these, what we're calling photon shields, these kind of flexible umbrella-like structures, which uh, couple deep space to our, to the SphereX V-groove radiators um, they're kind of shiny umbrellas, essentially, and um, will allow us to get our telescope down to 42 Kelvin, um, and then our focal plane arrays uh, with some additional cooling from a, another radiator we have on top of the telescope, um, we'll be able to get to about 38 Kelvin. So, um, so we're kind of excited about this uh, design that works pretty well, even in a low Earth orbit, where you have glow from the entire Earth pretty nearby. Um, I think the most innovative part of SphereX is um, the use of what's called linear variable filters um, as a spectrometer. So we don't use a dispersive element to, to take spectra. Um, we, we basically just put these filters um, in front of our detectors and linear variable filters, you can think of as essentially having a bandpass whose central frequency varies linearly across the array. So um, each uh, column of detectors, if you will, will have the same bandpass, and that bandpass will, will, will uh, be different as you go across um, uh, your focal plane uh, detector. So the idea is that in each of our focal planes, we have three detectors, um, each of which has a linear var variable filter mounted um, directly on top. This is a, a prototype mount that we built. Um, that's our instrument scientist, Phil Korngut, holding it. Um, uh, and uh, these will then be mounted to our telescope. As I mentioned, we'll have two focal planes. There's, there's a dichroic beam splitter in there. Um, the short wavelength uh, array will be measured in reflection. The longer wavelength one will be measured in transmission. Um, and so how we actually do spectroscopy is kind of unique. We don't actually move anything inside the instrument. We don't perform any dispersion in the instrument. What we do is we actually scan our entire telescope across the sky and build up spectra that way. So for example, if you're interested in finding the spectrum of this galaxy I'm showing here, um, what you would do is you would, um, you would basically take a series of exposures with SphereX um, a slightly different angle so that the galaxy fell in different spots on the array. And because it passed very slowly across each of these detectors, um, uh, with each exposure, you're essentially measuring one point on the spectrum. So what this means is that after 48 exposures, you can build up a complete spectrum. And complete means um, you know, given the bandwidth of each of these uh, um, linear variable filters, we've gotten a completely Nyquist sampled spectrum across the whole um, range that uh, SphereX is sampling. So you can see SphereX will measure from uh, 750 nanometers all the way to five microns. And so, right, so you can see we get two measurements with each exposure, one on the short wavelength side and one on the long wavelength side. So, this type of spectroscopy is a little bit unusual for astrophysics. It's not, not that um, uh, we don't have a whole lot of experience with it uh, within, within our community, but it's been used uh, in planetary science uh, to produce some really exciting results that, that uh, you've all seen, whether you know it or not. So those the beautiful color images of Pluto taken by the New Horizons um, uh, mission as it, as it did its flyby several years ago, were taken using a linear variable filter. So in other words, they've been used in space before. Um, and uh, um, so they're, they're kind of a known quantity. They're, they're, they're pretty simple to deal with. 
So how are we going to then get spectra of the entire sky, of every galaxy we want to observe? Um, this, this gets uh, a little complicated, but basically what we do is we just have to build up a survey plan that will allow us to uh, sample every six arc second point on the sky over the course of uh, six months uh, to, to build up a spectrum of every point. And so the way we do this, SphereX is going around the Earth. The uh, orbital period is about 99 minutes as it orbits at 730 kilometers. Uh, we take a series of exposures step by, by a small amount that shifts the array by about one uh, spectral channel unit. Um, as we're doing that, of course, the, the, uh, we're trying to stay fixed on the sky, but if you think of the Earth limb, the Earth limb starts to come up because we're orbiting pretty fast. So then we have to do a big slew to go to another part of the sky, and we repeat that. And then the next time we come around, we, we get the other points, uh, the, the other nearby points that we missed. Um, and then over time, we just slowly build up exposures that tile the entire sky and give us spectrum everywhere. And uh, we can do that, you know, using the, uh, the, uh, the, the motion of Earth around the sun, our, you know, our field of regard, um, you know, sampling in this, in this way, uh, so that we build a, a complete spectrum for every sky pixel every six months. And in the two-year mission, we'll then have four entire all-sky surveys that will basically give us um, 96 all-sky maps um, at six arc seconds which is pretty exciting. So um, I haven't mentioned uh, much about the survey yet. I'll get to that in a moment. But um, after we build up coverage over uh, two years, this is the kind of depth we'll get to. Um, this is uh, our, our limiting magnitude as compared to a couple of other surveys, the uh, two mass survey from the ground, uh, the pan stars also from the ground in Hawaii. Um, sorry, this is in astronomical magnitudes, um, which means that as you go up, we're getting dimmer. <laughs> um, over here, we have the, the wise all sky um, depth. Um, now, another thing I, I didn't mention was SphereX, but if you think about the way our sky um, scanning strategy works, we're going to build up a lot of extra coverage near the north ecliptic poles. And so in this region, we are creating what we're calling deep fields. And so shown here is our sensitivity. This, this is kind of a bounding range. Um, you know, if everything works really well or if everything works not quite as well, this is the sensitivity we'll get over the whole sky. And then in the deep field, we'll go several magnitudes uh, deeper because we'll just get so much more coverage. Um, so this is kind of how, how our our depth and our wavelength coverage compares to other surveys. So what are we going to do with this? Um, so I'll come back to inflation in a moment. Um, but actually, we've organized our science team around investigating three big science questions, one of which involves inflation. So that's to look at, to study how the universe began, how galaxies formed initially. And then also, we're going to study some uh, science within our own uh, galaxy to look at what the conditions are for life to begin. And so the first one um, is to probe inflation through primordial non-Gaussianity, which I kind of motivated earlier. Um, we're also going to look at, in the deep fields, near-infrared background fluctuations, looking at the integrated cosmic light production. So that will enable us to, to study early galaxies. Um, and then uh, in answering the third question, to answer the third question, we're going to be looking at stars in the Milky Way and look at absorption features. And the particular wavelength region we're covering is actually very well suited to study biogenic ices in the galaxy. It's, it's well known that a lot of water, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide in the galaxy is actually locked up in ice but the full inventory isn't studied very well. And so SphereX will allow us to study, um, to do a survey of the entire galaxy and, uh, and, and understand this question in great more detail. So first, back to inflation. 
how is Spherex going to constrain large scale structure and make measurements of inflation? And uh, this is going to be done through exquisite measurements of galaxy redshifts. So um, our plate scale is six arc seconds. So I, that's, that's the resolution of our survey. Uh, most galaxies are two arc seconds, one to two arc seconds or larger. So um, we're not going to detect every galaxy in the universe, but we're going to be able to detect almost everything out to about redshift of one and a half or two. And of those, detect, we'll detect about a billion galaxies, and we'll be able to constrain uh, 10 million of them to extremely tight redshift constraints. So in other words, that's measuring the, the third dimension, the distance to those galaxies. And then we'll be able to get a looser constraint on about half those galaxies we, we detect to about the 10% level. And the way we're going to do that is um, SphereX is not going to actually try to discover new galaxies. We're going to um, select known sources from existing catalogs, from uh, surveys like PanStars and, and DES, and just obtain SphereX spectra for each. And this has a nice, um, uh, you know, selecting using a catalog that's uh, um, developed, that, or that's uh, built from data taken at much higher resolution than SphereX can help us a lot with sources that are close to each other. Um, so we can get around some confusion issues um, nicely that way. And um, so what we'll do, we'll, we'll measure a SphereX spectrum. We'll get um, measurements that look kind of like we see here. Uh, these are two examples. Um, and then we essentially do a template fit. Um, we'll take uh, libraries of, um, of uh, galaxy spectra templates and uh, uh, figure out what type of galaxy best fits that. And using known features, for example, the 1.6 micron bump um, or various breaks in the spectra, um, we'll, we'll be able to constrain the redshift quite well. So depending on you know, whether we can resolve this bump, um, you know, what type it is, that, that'll determine whether an individual galaxy will fall as well, as well as the signal to noise um, of the individual measurements that will determine whether, whether any individual galaxy falls in this very high precision or medium precision bucket. Um, so we've simulated this process using the Cosmos data set. So this was um, a fairly deep survey uh, taken with Spitzer and Hubble data. And we've used some analysis tools which have been developed for uh, redshift surveys that will be carried out with the Euclid mission and the Roman Space Telescope, uh, which until very recently was called uh, WFIRST. Um, and uh, it seems like it'll be pretty robust. And so while SphereX won't be able to go as far back in redshift as uh, a bigger telescope like the Euclid or the Roman Space Telescope, um, it will be able to study the entire sky. Um, Euclid and Roman will, will end up making surveys um, of, of subsets of the sky, not the entire sky. And so that's really where the power of spherics comes in. Um, so um, based on how well we think we're going to be able to do on redshift, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we're going to be able to essentially make a measurement of the um, matter power spectrum as well as the bi spectrum. Um, and um, <clears throat> we think we'll be able to distinguish, especially on these largest scales, um, the difference between uh, different non-Gaussianity parameters. So essentially, we'll um, carry out a process that's familiar to a lot of cosmologists. We'll use you know, libraries of theoretically generated spectra, fit to our results, and so on, and use that to infer um, in a Bayesian way um, these parameters. And so you can see we can distinguish not only non-Gaussianity, but we think we'll be able to measure other parameters of inflation. Alpha sub s is what's known as the running of the spectral index. So this is the, um, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the a curvature to the spectrum of primordial fluctuations uh, created by inflation. And this will be uh, allow us to make pretty strong constraints on different inflation models as well. So this is, this is where we come back to inflation. So if you look at one of these 
likelihood plots, the 68% confidence intervals of primordial non-Gaussianity versus running of the spectral index as measured by Planck at this point, uh, we think we'll be able to do about a factor of 10 better with sphere X. So, so that's where um, the exciting constraints on inflation will come in um, from, from sphere X. So um, now I'm going to uh, briefly mention the other uh, science investigations that SphereX will carry out and um, also tell you guys about the, the data products that SphereX will produce, which I think um, are going to be very exciting. There's going to be a lot, of, uh, a lot in there for pretty much uh, anyone, I think. So I'm excited to find out what, what everyone, what the community will do with, with the SphereX data. Um, so um, our second science investigation into galaxy formation, um, we, um, on our science team, we have Asanto Kure um, is uh, involved in this and is leading this particular effort. Um, but the idea is to look back in time uh, towards the epoch of reionization uh, when galaxies were first coming into existence. And while we won't be able to resolve or even detect any individual galaxy from this epoch, uh, we will be able to, we think, detect the integrated light from, from all these galaxies as it piles up. And, um, you know, this will, um, as galaxies were forming, uh, this different, um, you know, light at different wavelengths were emitted. This is redshifted by the expansion of the universe. Uh, we then have to consider uh, what happens at, at very late time when we think there's actually this uh, other effect called intrahalo light where there's actually some stars that are um, kicked out of galaxies that are, that are glowing as well. Um, and uh, we're gonna look at essentially all of that. So um, what we'll do is we'll look at our deep field maps. These are um, you know, gonna be about uh, 10 to 50 times deeper than our, our all sky survey We'll create mosaics and 96 bands, and uh, we'll investigate um, how, <clears throat> how this compares to models of emissions, emission from galaxies over cosmic time, and then other models as well, things like diffuse emission from, from uh, this intrahalo light, um, and then potentially other effects as well. So this has been used by a number of groups to, to study um, uh, similar types of uh, images of, of uh, near-infrared background fluctuations taken with Herschel data, Spitzer data, I think is the most analogous thing in terms of the wavelength coverage in the near-infrared. Also the Cyber Sounding Rocket project, which was led by Jamie Bach, Santa Cure was involved in that as well. Um, uh, with a sounding rocket, you only get about 15 minutes of data, but <laughs> nonetheless, uh, they're able to investigate the, this uh, technique as well. Um, so the idea is you'll be able to do pretty uh, nice component separation with all this spectral data that, that uh, SphereX will provide um, and be able to um, study things like the amplitude of the, the clustering power spectrum um, at different redshifts as well. Uh, so this is just illustrating simulated SphereX um, data with what's actually been done with, with Spitzer data. And we, we think um, with SphereX, we'll, do, we'll be able to, you know, not only have this broad wavelength coverage, but, but also just improve the sensitivity of what's, what's been able to be done in the past by factors of several. So, so that's pretty exciting. Um, the third science investigation that we're undertaking within our science team, as I mentioned, is to look at, at ICES. Uh, so we think that 99% of the ice of the water, sorry, the H2O in our galaxy is actually frozen into ice, uh, the ice phase. So um, ice, um, both in terms of water ice and frozen, um, you know, solid CO2, uh, CO and, and other species, um, which it's kind of interesting. This is something I didn't know a whole lot about before I started uh, working on SphereX, but um, these ices kind of uh, coagulate onto, um, onto uh, thin, you know, um, tiny grains of interstellar dust. You get these little tiny uh, grains of ice floating out there. 
and they have uh, very specific absorption features in the infrared. So what we'll do is look at stars in the Milky Way and um, essentially look at absorption features and from that infer uh, what ice uh, has to be present in clouds, stellar envelopes, and protoplanetary disks in between the emitting star and us here on Earth. And um, so this has been done with previous experiments, um, I think with uh, Spitzer data as well. Um, uh, and, uh, but the nice thing that SphereX will do is um, expand the number of known targets from you know, a few dozen to thousands or possibly millions. And so we'll really be able to study the statistics and get um, a full inventory of the abundance of these different ice species in uh, the, the galaxy. So that, that's very exciting. It'll help us understand how uh, star and planetary systems have formed. Um, so um, this data, of course, as with all NASA missions, will become public. And it'll become public fairly quickly after we take the data. In fact, um, we've committed to um, publishing our raw images um, on uh, a public archive within two months of, of collecting the data. So folks will be able to access it quite quick, quickly. So by our raw images, I just mean these exposures that still have this varying band pass across the array. So um, it, uh, if you're interested in any specific object, you'll be able to go and, and look that up using this interface that exists on um, uh, the, what's called the URSA archive, the, the NASA IPAC Infrared Science Archive, um, which has been uh, developed and funded by NASA over many years to, to serve data from a number of infrared missions. It will be the host for, Spit, for SphereX data as well. So you'll just be able to use all of those tools, which um, some of you may be familiar with already, but um, you know, there's a great user um, uh, community out there for interfacing with data through this, this tool. A lot of the AstroPy um, tools that folks are familiar with kind of uh, natively can connect to the URSA database. So you won't have to do a whole lot to interact with the SphereX data once it becomes public. Um, so, What's going to be in that data? Well, there's quite a bit of science that um, you know the spheric science team is not going to be able to tackle, and so you know we'll we'll leave that up to you, the community, to to take on. Um, and so you know I think it's been proven over the decades that uh, this type of all sky survey uh, can really um, make an impact for a long period of time. I think. Uh, the example I always go back to is, is IRAS. You know, this was a um, hundred micron um, uh, survey of the entire sky done from space in the early 80s. And uh, that data is still being used today. It's really the best we have at hundred microns even now. And this has led to, you know, 800,000 citations over the, over the, you know, 40 years that, that we've had that data present. So, so we're hoping that the SphereX data will also create such a, a great legacy that IRAS and then uh, this other um, uh, series of missions is also produced. So what the, the goodies that we think are gonna be in there, but you know, I'm sure we haven't thought of everything um, are, are shown up here. Things like, you know, you'll, you'll be able to do a lot more with the galaxy data than we're planning to do um, within the SphereX team. Um, just if you're interested in stars themselves, we're gonna have near infrared spectra of everything, of all the stars um, that, that we can see with high signal to noise. There'll be you know, more than hundred million of them. We'll see cold stars um, in particular, may, maybe detecting new ones and certainly studying ones that are already known, um, studying the atmospheres of brown dwarfs and so on. Um, even though uh, we don't think we'll be able to uh, find everything that's at high redshift. Certainly there'll be a number of bright quasars that will appear in the SphereX data. And, you know, we have no plans to do anything with those. So we'll leave it up to you to comb through that and, and see what you can find in there. Um, there's also going to be solar system objects. We'll be able to study asteroids and comets. Uh, 
possibly detecting new ones, but you know, we, we are not really planning on that. Um, but all that, all those moving, they'll move quickly in our, in our survey. So we may not have the same um, <clears throat> resolution in terms of the spectral coverage, but, uh, but, but it'll still be certainly very interesting. It'll cover a range of uh, the spectrum that's, that's uh, somewhat difficult to get from the ground for, for dimmer objects. Um, and then there's a lot that can be done in terms of studying other uh, line emission in the galaxy as well. So, so that's, that's very exciting and, and we're looking forward to seeing what the community can do. So just to wrap up um, and, and take, have some time for some questions. Um, so right now we're in a phase of, um, you know, in NASA lingo, we call the preliminary design phase. So what we're doing is, um, you know, planning in much greater detail how we're going to actually build the instrument, how we're going to analyze the data, and how much it's going to cost, um, and making sure that will fit within our, our 250 million cost cap. Um, but the plan is that it's all looking great so far. Um, the plan is to launch in 2024. Those of you who have been through a, a NASA mission um, before, um, we have a preliminary design review coming up in um, October. So that's kind of our, our next really big milestone. But um, after that, we'll actually start putting hardware together. We'll start writing um, the, the data analysis pipeline and so on. And uh, I'll be ready to, um, to analyze the data as soon as it starts coming in. Um, so like I said, we're, we're actually going to be, um, the, the data as we take it and we do some initial processing, we'll, we're going to be putting out within two months. Um, we're going to, on top of that, we're actually going to create what we call major data releases every six months. So that's when we have an entire full sky and we're able to go back and make sure our calibration is very good. Um, and uh, reanalyze everything, and so we'll we'll have these stamped major data releases that happen after each after each six month survey is complete, and so we think those will kind of be the main products that people will want to interact with. But um, if you want something on a much shorter time scale, uh, a more raw type data will be available as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we've designed this instrument to create a major impact in three key science areas that will be investigating within the SphereX team. So we'll be carrying out this large volume galaxy redshift survey and uh, using that to constrain inflation. We'll be um, creating mosaic maps of our deep regions um, in 96 bands to constrain the history of galaxy formation. And then we'll be able to study the spectra of, of ice absorption um, in our own galaxy. And then on top of that, of course, as I've said, I'll be very excited to find out what you will do with the SphereX data. Um, if you want to find out more, um, our URL is listed above, and I'll be happy to take any questions in the remaining time. Um, can I ask a question? Yes, I think it's uh, slide number 23 for the figure. OK, well, I don't see my slide numbers. Just tell me when to stop. I was actually looking at the Dropbox, so. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Is it this one? No, it's actually the uh, the spectra for Paths of Galaxy and the Star for Me Galaxy. This one? Yes, this one. Sure, so sure. those two small figures, it looks like for the Paths of Galaxy, it has like border range, but Right. So for me, it's like tighter. I, is there any like yeah. reason? That's a great observation. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a little, so that yeah, this is kind of the likelihood of redshift plotted here. Yeah. And you can see, you know, this orange case is like a lower redshift and it's, you can see in the simulation, it's detected a much higher signal to noise than this star forming galaxy. But you can see that the features at this passive galaxy, uh, the spectral features tend to be a lot broader, right? This, this 1.6 micron bump is pretty wide. Whereas at this star forming galaxy, we have these um, uh, H alpha features, H beta features that are, that are uh, much narrower. And so that actually allows us, you know, maybe a little counterintuitively to constrain the redshift 
even better than you would at a much higher signal to noise measurement. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, thanks. So, so it's really just about what spectral features happen to be present in that particular galaxy. Thank you. Brendan, you may have mentioned it, but I, I, I think I lost it. How large is your deep field region in terms of square degrees? Oh yeah, good question. I think I had that up here. Um, oh, I didn't say. Um, it's going to be, um, it's, it's about 100 square degrees um, in the north and then another one 100 square degrees in the south. The one in the north is going to be right on top of the north ecliptic pole. And the one in the south is going to be offset a little bit because the um, one of the Magellanic clouds is actually right on the southern ecliptic pole. So um, I'm sure someone would, would find a very deep image of uh, the Magellanic clouds to be interesting, but it's a little hard to do the galaxy formation uh, study <laughs> if you're looking through that. So. Yeah, and six arc second uh, resolution, that's also rough. Right, right. And yeah, you can see actually one thing, um, this flashed by kind of quickly and I, I didn't mention it, but um, the Euclid mission, which is uh, launching in just a couple of years, is also doing deep surveys and we're, you know, uh, gonna try to create some synergy by making sure we're, we're well overlapped um, so that, you know, could potentially add some interesting science that you can do for, through joint analyses. So they, they have a very different instrument, of course. They're, they're using a grism to get spectra. Um, so they'll have much higher resolution. And yeah, the, I think there's all kinds of cool things that can be done. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. Well, if you think of them later, you're very welcome to contact me anytime. Um, you know, we're really excited. This, you know, this uh, mission is being made with taxpayer money. And, uh, you know, it's the, the data is going to be for all of us. And uh, I would definitely want to hear what you guys are interested in doing with it. Well, certainly the, the, the galaxy redshifts are going to be extremely useful for, for things like calibrating uh, Rubin Observatory. Uh, wide. It doesn't go quite as deep, but it'll be, there'll actually be quite a bit better redshifts. So. Yeah, actually, that. Thank you for mentioning that. That was that was something um, I I didn't mention, um, but <clears throat> we're we're hoping to you know basically create agreements with uh, the Rubin Observatory and the LSST survey so that we can um, you know use the uh, catalogs produced through LSST to um, use as our, our our galaxy sample because. Uh, pan stars is is somewhat uneven. I mean, I guess all the ground-based surveys will be at some point, but it, but it might it might help basically as our, for our um, you know our reference catalog that we use to to measure redshifts. Uh, so yeah. you know, depending on how that all comes online and the timing, um, hopefully the timing may, nice may not be wonderful, but uh, but yeah, it'll 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 definitely be useful. Uh, the north will be probably still be pan stars because there's not much. Uh, all sky that's going to be available. Oh, great. Excellent. Other questions? Well, thank you so much, Brendan. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to, to, to get my hands on some of this. Uh, you know, the 100,000 galaxy clusters sounds amazingly good to me. Uh, yeah. If, uh, you know, if, if some of the x-ray data actually becomes available at the same time, that would be very nice. Yes, yes. I, um... Yeah, E. Rosita, we're hoping to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's we'll, a we'll complicated deal. Yeah. Only that was a NASA mission. Um, excellent. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Brendan again. I will. I will do a non-virtual collapse since I'm. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it.